Hi everyone, and welcome to the five-year commemoration of Movement on the Ground. Now, a couple of weeks back, we brought you the stories of the situation on Lesbos following the fire that left Camp Moria in ashes. Through that webinar, we connected with a lot of new people, and we therefore felt that this was the perfect time to uh, take a moment and look at five years of the organization and share a bit more about how it came to be and how the team currently spends their days. Today, I'm sitting down with uh, three of Movement's five founders, Charlie, Adil, and Johnny, uh, to talk about how they up and left everything to go to Lesbos and help out, how that initial decision sparked the creation of Movement on the Ground, what it's like to run a humanitarian foundation, and what the situation's like now, and of course, how they look at the future. And we're going to do all of that in just one hour, so I guess we better get started. Welcome to five years of Movement on the Ground. Hi, guys. Hi, Amber. How Hello. are you? How are you feeling about today and about the upcoming five-year commemoration of Movement on the Ground? Well, it's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting us. It's nice to be uh, invited back. Um, Does it feel like five years? <laughs> no, sometimes it feels like 50 years yeah. and sometimes it feels like uh, a few days. Because yeah. Strange, huh? especially these, um, yeah, these days with the, um, you know, the, the, the corona, the, the, the fire. Um, yeah, we've... Um, yeah. Well, not only we, but a lot of people have, have been up for the test. And I, I think one of the things, I was there a few weeks ago uh, where we did the last broadcast, of course, and what struck me, and I think we've, we've discussed this quite a lot, was uh, we're five years further from Movement on the Ground, but it was like being back to five years ago. You know, the scenes of people sleeping on the side of the streets and using the, the, the guardrails to stop the cars going off the cliff as, as, as their clothes hangers and stuff like that. I mean, it was really, really... In that way, confronting. Very, yeah, confronting, very confronting that we're just back in time and we're just yeah. back. You know, we've done so much in the last five years, and then suddenly, after the, the tragedy that happened with Moria, I mean, uh, it's good that it's not there anymore, to be honest. But it's uh, you know, the, the new situation is not not much better, but it's it's still it's not it's not resolved yet, and that's really really confronting. It yeah. seems like you're back to the beginning. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Which was which was really tough. Eh? I mean, there yeah. was uh, walking around the Moria when it was burnt uh, was really heartbreaking. Was really uh, emotional. And now we're 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 really back to, to, to day one again. Yeah, I think the reality the reality is that it feels like we're we're back to to uh, well ground zero to yep. say so. Uh, on the other hand, we've learned a lot in the past five years, and we've got an amazing team of people on the ground working really really hard at dealing with the situation. Uh, so in that sense, I'm, I'm, I am optimistic for, for, for the near future, um, but it's tough. It's definitely at this moment uh, a big struggle, uh, facing winter, of course, um, and there are a lot of vulnerable people uh, in a very dire situation. And tell me a bit more about the current situation, because there are two camps that you are involved in, one on Lesbos and one on Samos, and both have actually been hit by trouble, so to say, over the past couple of weeks. What's been happening there? Yeah, well, um, on Lesbos we've had, of course, the fire. Uh, unfortunately, very sad, uh, last Friday we had on Samos a very heavy uh, uh, earthquake. Um, fortunately, um, uh, no casualties in, inside the camp and, and uh, no damage relatively. Uh, unfortunately, very sad, two youngsters uh, uh, passed away uh, from the Greek community. Yeah, two local Greek students. Two local Greek students. Years old. Yeah. yeah, 17 years old. Uh, so very sad. Um, uh, and, and then last weekend, we had a relatively also a significant fire inside the camp, uh, bringing 350 people uh, without any shelter. Um, it's not the first time that we are facing these kind of situations. I mean, in the past five years, we've seen so many fires, and um, a lot of these incidents is something that we've been warning for. Uh, I mean, uh, these situations is why we, as Movement on the Ground, are on those islands, to help, to relieve uh, both the local Greeks and, and of course, the refugee population. Uh, but it's difficult. It's difficult times. Uh, and, of course, COVID, uh, in addition to all of that, uh, brings a lot of uh, tension uh, to the situation. I can imagine. And let's talk a bit more about the current situation, because uh, especially with the fire in Camp Moria a couple of weeks back, we saw a resurgence of the discussions about migration flows and the European Union's handling of the issue. Um, opponents of the EU's policy are demanding that the camps are immediately evacuated or that countries step up their efforts to relocate, relocate refugees across Europe. Um, from what I understand, movement on the ground has not necessarily voiced an opinion on either of these two scenarios. Charlie, why is that? Yeah, I, I think we have. I mean, I think we, we've always been very strong to the European Union that, that this situation shouldn't, shouldn't be happening. I mean, uh, you know, we're the, l the last people in the world to, to, 
to be happy that this is going on. That Moria was was really hell on earth. I mean, there's people that we've met uh, who have been to the, the 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 real what you think is the hot spots in the world, and they've said that Moria is the worst place they've ever seen. You know, so it was really uh, terrible what was going on there. It was, uh, there was absolutely no excuse at all for the conditions that, that, that these people were, were put into. So we've been advocating for some time that this needs to change, and ideally, of course, we don't want there to be a camp there. Unfortunately, that need is still there. It's, uh, you know, so I, I do think we have been quite vo vocal on this. Uh, and it's to, uh, to the European Commission uh, 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 people, to, to ambassadors, to politicians from several uh, European countries, and we've always, we've always been able to show them the reality and how difficult it is for the people to live in those conditions. And it is actually unacceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we've been uh, talking to deaf ears, to be very honest. Uh, it's reality, and I think that's what, what movement essentially did, is we, 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 we accept, as difficult as it is, the reality on the ground. And unfortunately, we can choose, well, we sit in an idealistic world and we're super optimistic people, so yeah, we, we, we live there um, in, our, in our fantasies. But, the reality on the ground is that there's people suffering, there's families suffering uh, day in and day out, and we've made a choice to help those people from day one. Uh, and whether that's uh, you know helping them off a boat, helping them get onto a boat to go to Athens uh, on the whole journey uh, through the islands uh, uh, where we can, we, we've played a role. And, and that's really the, 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 the essence of why we're there still. Because I've looked at some comments and the reason why I'm asking about whether you're taking a stand or not is um, that there have been some comments about the relocation of refugees. Um, earlier this year, there was a petition to get 500 children to the Netherlands and movement on the ground didn't sign that petition. But then just now, weeks after the fire in Moria, uh, it was announced that you've received a grant from the Dutch government to build three shelters on the mainland of Greece to house unaccompanied minors. So that could give the impression that because you're accepting money from the Dutch government, you're not necessarily taking a stand and you might actually be enabling countries to look away from the issue. Mm. So could you explain what your reasoning is for, on the one hand saying, we don't agree with the situation, but we're not gonna sign a petition, but we are accepting money from the Dutch government? Well, yeah. maybe just a short, I mean, We've, we've been in demonstrations. I mean, from the early days, we've been in demonstrations. Uh, we've signed petitions in the early days about Moria, about evacuation of Moria. We've been talking to, to officials uh, uh, with several governments, and we just didn't see any results uh, for the reality for the people on the ground. Uh, but we've always been advocating uh, for change, uh, for relocation, uh, um, for fast uh, asylum procedures, uh, and for dignifying the conditions while people are in that situation. So that is something that we've always been doing from the early days. Um, we just see that our power lies in making impact immediately on the ground for the people. I think in particular with the kids, I mean, this charity was kick-started uh, from the image of a child lying on a beach. I mean, that's why we all got motivated to, to be involved in this. Uh, and one of the most uh, impactful things that you see when you're there and just looking, I mean, this, this image is so powerful. When, when you're on the island, you come across thousands of children. Uh, luckily, most of them are with, with mums and dads and with their family, but there are thousands and far too many that have come through the, the camps we've been involved in that are unaccompanied, that are pretending to be part of a family, but then, you know, get, get, get left on, on, the, on the wayside, etc. cetera. Um, you know, and we have always, always, always wanted to help the kids. We want to help everybody, but the kids, the kids touch you in a different way, of course. Um, you know, and we started um, to become very frustrated and, and despondent with the, the whole system that nobody was taking these kids, which is an, an insane idea. And I think last year we started to, to try and take things into our own hands. And we started uh, to look around and we quickly came across a charity, an amazing organization in, in Athens called HOME, um, who was specifically looking after uh, children. Uh, in Athens, and we we approached them. Uh, we we quickly uh, we quickly realised that our our Good motivations, values. our values are very very aligned, uh, and we felt very comfortable with each other. So we said, look, let's 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 start building more of these shelters, uh, and we started on a project to, to 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 fund three projects. This was last year's 2019, uh, so way before this petition came along. Um, and we were busy with this. We were looking for private donors, which we've secured. We were looking for any, uh, any found funds that came along. Uh, and then, of course, this, this fantastic initiative comes along. Hey, let's take 500 kids away from, from one camp. 
great. It's, 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 if it works, fantastic. But we say, well, what about all the other thousands of people that are there? Um, you know, so we just chose not to support another organization's campaign. And that's all we did. And I genuinely don't think that our signature would have made the difference one way or the other. Uh, the reality is, as Sadil said, we didn't believe this would work because we, we genuinely believed all the people we've had from the Dutch government that they weren't going to do this. And that's why in 2019, way before this campaign, we decided to go another route. Uh, and you know, we've now opened our first uh, 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 house with, uh, with uh, the home charity where there's what, 16, 17, 16 uh, girls, girls in there. With three teenage uh, moms, so yeah. with three toddlers. You know, um, and the atmosphere is incredible. I mean, yeah. there's a second one being, uh, being opened uh, in, in the coming in week. So, weeks. You know, so yes, I mean, we as an organization are just facing and dealing and accepting the reality and trying to make the best of it. Yeah, so to summarize, you applaud uh, any kind of initiative that will dignify uh, the situation sure. for the refugees. Yeah. I think we're all on the same page that we don't want a single child to be in any camp. No. We're all on the same page. Uh, so we definitely applaud any initiative that can make that happen. No. And for you, it was just more about, we feel that it's taken too long, we're going to take matters into our own hands. There's just political unwillingness, and not only in Holland, I mean, it's just abroad uh, in, in, yeah. in the whole of Europe. There's just political unwillingness to take people and to evacuate people from the Greek islands. That's just a hard reality that we need to deal with. So we just, cho we just chose to help the people that are still there in that hard reality. Yeah. And make an impact as fast as you can. Yeah. Yeah. There's a one under other comment that I'd like to uh, zoom into for just a moment. Um, I've seen some comments about the fact that supposedly it's difficult to, mo to work with movement on the ground in the camps and that you would be hawking your spot uh, and not necessarily collaborating with other NGOs. Um, how do you feel about that when you hear those types of comments? Do you, do you, can you see yourself in what is being said? Well, first of all, I mean, we take that very seriously. Uh, I mean, coming from a philosophy where uh, our camp to campus philosophy that is really um, uh, about bringing everyone to the table, creating a healing environment, um, having a very collaborative and cooperative uh, uh, approach to things um, uh, from uh, UNHCR, UN organizations to the uh, small Greek organizations. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy to hear. Um, nevertheless, the past five years, I mean, if you see the track record, there are so many organizations uh, that were involved. Um, uh, in our operation, in our mission, and, and still yeah. are, and, and definitely still are. So in, in that sense, um, we believe that camp to campus is bringing everyone together uh, and making impact in togetherness. Um, uh, you just don't fall in love uh, with everyone uh, on first sight. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer to, to learn about each other and to understand each other's uh, mindset and uh, approach and way of working. But the willingness to work is defi oh, well, definitely... Definitely. You know, this is an open invitation to anyone uh, that wants to make a uh, positive change to the situation on the ground, definitely. But is, do you, if you remember in the beginning, I mean, one of the, the things that we realized we could do was fill the gaps for other charities. You know, so we provided uh, defib def defibrillators to doctors, dry suits to, the, to other charities, speed boats to other charities, because they needed these things. So our whole essence was working with people who were there and filling their needs, uh, you know, as yeah, a facilitator. Yeah, it was almost frustrating not to be asked to sit at the, the table of the big meetings to yeah. know what's going on. Like, you know, we can't help if we don't know what some organizations yeah. need. And we, we, we quickly got to sit at the table because we just were working with yeah, everyone yeah. and just trying to help out everyone. Yeah. So it is difficult to hear this criticism because we, we, you know, we try to bra embrace everybody and that's really yeah. the, the core value of... Uh, yeah. of it could also be a fact, I mean, uh, bear in mind, we're a very small organization um, and so, sometimes we just didn't have the capacity. I mean, for many years we just had three people in Amsterdam uh, being the head office uh, and a lot of people on the ground just working 24-7 um, in, in a very tense situation uh, under a lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, that means that sometimes you just don't connect with a certain uh, situation the way you would love to, just because of the conditions uh, and the tense uh, circumstances. So yeah. it can be challenging at times, but you are indeed looking for synergies. 
Always. 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 And I, I, to be honest, I mean, I, I, you know, I look at the grand and I look at the relationships we have with the, the charities that we're working with. You know, everything we've done, we've done with partners. Well, thank you for clearing that up. And we, of course, welcome all of you to keep asking your questions about movement on the ground's operations and development, should you have them. Now, let's talk about the past. Let's go back in time and look at how this all started, because five years is something that was created somewhere along the line. Um, in 2015, there was indeed the infamous and heartbreaking photo of uh, Alain Gourdi, the boy who washed up ashore uh, uh, on the Greek coast. Um, and if I remember correctly from your stories in that moment, Johnny, you called up Adil. You said, have you seen this? We need to do something. Let's cancel our trip to, Le uh, to Ibiza. Let's go yeah. to Lesbos and help out. Could you tell me why it was specifically this photo that actually moved you into action to say we need to do something? Um, it wasn't the first thing in the news about the whole refugee situation, but it was the first thing that really, really uh, hit me hard and also, you know, my two buddies. Um, and we did have a holiday uh, to Ibiza and we just didn't feel that it was right to, to dance in the same seas, you know, where, where kids are washing up. Um, and we wanted to make a call to action and we did. Well, and we said, let's um, collect some clothes that we can bring there and blankets and stuff and raise money. <clears throat> and after three days, we were like, let's, let's just go ourselves because, um, you know, maybe that's not what's needed. Let's go find out for ourselves. And um, that, that's exactly what we did. Uh, it all happened in less than three days. <laughs> and um, yeah, I called a deal. I said, I booked us two, two flights to, uh, to, uh, to Lesbos. Um, we went there with three other friends. And it, it changed our lives completely. Yeah. And so, because I see a photo here of a lot of clothes, all of these were brought with you on the plane? Yeah, it was a thousand kilograms of clothing. Uh, and this is actually my living room. <laughs> and my bedroom was also full uh, of clothing. A lot of friends. There was a lot of readiness. Um, and a lot of people really wanted to support the action. Um, and um, uh, yeah, we just got on the plane. Uh, five friends and uh, went over there. Uh, we thought we were well prepared. Oh, you did? <laughs> we thought we were well prepared. There was a lot of things uh, that you could read. And of course, on social media, there were a lot of people that were already there. I mean, at that moment, there was a lot of mobilization from around the world for people to go to Lesbos and help yep. out. I mean, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were arriving on that island. Um, but I don't think anything could prepare us for what we witnessed there. I mean, uh, the day that we arrived, 10,000 people arrived in 48 hours. I mean, that's almost the, the number that last year arrived on, on Lesbos. So. It was, uh, yeah, it was the beginning uh, of movement on the ground. And so tell me what happened. So you take uh, a flight, you uh, arrive at Lesbos, you have a hotel, you drop your stuff, and then you just walk to the shore. Like, how, 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 did, you, um, how did you start? Yeah, we, um, we landed. We, we rented, a, I think, two or three... Three minivans. Three minivans. Um, we landed on Mytilini, uh, but we had to be at the other side of the island, at Molivos which is about an hour drive. Um, yeah, what hit us first was uh, the beauty of the island. Uh, reminded of a little bit of Ibiza. Ibiza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and we were expecting refugees to be everywhere, to walk everywhere, but it was a beautiful day. There was just people going to work, people going to the beach. It was really strange. And then when we arrived in Molivos, and we had one lead to, to visit um, Starfish. Um, and, and to sign up and, and go and help. And there was a Dutch lady, actually, that we met, and we said, we're here to help. And she's like, well, it's not busy now, so please go to your hotel, and we'll let you know when something happens. And we went to our hotel, and we, we, the sun was going down. We almost opened up a, a beer, and like, what are we going to do? Uh, and then we, they called our names. They said, Adil and Johnny, please co come and help. And then uh, we saw our first sight of, of a... A refugee boat being Coast Guard uh, boat. Coast Guard boat with refugee on it being uh, yeah put on on shore and all wet and <clears> with, the, with the blankets on it uh, and they were just like okay please help and we were like okay but what do we do we had no idea we had no idea yeah and a lot of people were in distress they, these people were for hours in 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 the, in the ocean before they were rescued so uh, uh, including I think 20 children approximately. A lot of hypothermia, uh, children in shock, uh, parents and mothers that were, that were crying. And 
Um, and we took them to a nearby field uh, where we tried to give them some warm food, uh, dry clothing that we had uh, with us. And before we knew, the five of us were in, in a sort of a first response emergency situation, taking care of 70 people that have been for hours in the ocean. And, uh, and there was no time of thinking uh, or realizing what was happening. It was just helping those kids, those children. Um, and I will never forget that. And, uh, children where you just couldn't connect with uh, anymore. Uh, completely in shock, uh, just staring in front of themselves. Parents that couldn't take care of their own children because they were completely cramped up. Um, and and uh, it started around six, seven in the evening and it took until three in the night before we got everyone was sort of calmed down, dry clothes, warmed up a little bit, just in a bare open field uh, with some tarps and, 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 uh, and a line uh, to protect those people that had to sleep that night uh, in open air. Uh, and I think that really shook us up. Uh, we were just a couple of hours uh, on the island uh, and, we've just found, and we found ourselves uh, giving first response in a very emergency situation and, and uh, with people, two people that had really had faced death uh, in the ice. Um, and, that, and those days, um, yeah, were, were very instinctive. Uh, no time for emotions. Uh, but there were so many people uh, coming on the shores that were uh, in need of help. Um, and um, we, we, we worked around the clock. Uh, we went to bed at three, we woke up at six in the morning. It was, um, uh, yeah, it, it was very, very impactful. Yeah. Um, yeah, especially the first couple of days when you're just on the beach welcoming these people. The difference in how they get to the beaches was so, was huge. You know, it was, it, it was people in fear, but it was also people in laughter or like we made it and started hugging and, so, so that was that was a lot to take in in, the, in those first couple of days. You're just on this automatic pilot, getting these people safe on the beach, driving them to the camps, going back, helping new people. Yeah, it was. It's, it's, it's yeah. interesting when you see this picture. Then, then, <clears throat> then you, you you learned techniques, huh? how to bring the boats in. Yeah, not sideways, standing in the water, making sure that people were calming down, not jumping over the yeah, side. Yeah, the whole protocol. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I was just about to ask, um, you are not uh, experienced uh, su uh, uh, supporters of humanitarian crises, uh, you are not therapists, so uh, you just went, you kind of went there just on a whim, you were like, I want to do something, let's just go. How do you know what to do? And wasn't it, uh, because you said there was no time for emotions, but your body and your mind must get exhausted ex at some point from all of these impressions. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and you could see that. I mean, there were a lot of people that really struggled with their emotions. And um, uh, I think for me personally, um, uh, I was there for the people. So um, uh, I'm always uh, optimistic. I always try to set, put on a smile because I just believe that's what the, these people, you know, uh, at first sight need. Um, and, uh, but it, was, it wasn't easy. Uh, it, it, it still feels like a, a movie, you know. It, uh, there was no time for feeling emotions. And uh, it's very instinctive, uh, helping people, very, very basic. And sometimes it, it, it differs from just uh, putting an arm around someone that, is, that just arrived. And, and, and the other moment, you're almost playing, uh, you're almost having to be an ambulance for, for, uh, for a mother who's pregnant and, and needs to go to, to the hospital, but there is no ambulance. Um, uh, I, I think we are, um, uh, we're always positive and that really takes you to any, through any situation. Um, uh, that's, what, that's what took me to, uh, to those moments. Uh, yeah, you had, <clears throat> you had families in your van with children, you try to make them laugh, we bought lollipops. We, yeah. we try to put on music from their from their homes, you know, from from their countries. Uh, you, you know, you, you speak Arabic, Arabic, yeah. So you taught me a few words to to feel welcome. You just do everything to make them feel okay. And By the way, we we know now that in a nine seater, twenty people can fit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cramp up and see how yeah. far you can get. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Driving up and down, and then every time saying a new boat landed, they're over there. Go and get them make them feel welcome, bring them to the camps, drive back, and this, uh, yeah, yeah tw 24 That's One seven. of the first images that I remember is driving around and you'd be driving along the road and you'd be always looking at sea. 
to see if there was boats coming. Yeah, and yeah. You know, I most, still have that. Most of the time, I still you have it. Still when I'm on that boat yeah. and we're back on the dirt yeah. road, and you watch you're the ocean, see, yeah. you're still you're still looking for boats. Yeah. You're really so weird. trained to look for yeah. boats. Yeah. Yeah. It was really strange yeah, because you would have, and then you would literally drive along, and then suddenly you would say, right, well, there's a boat coming, so we'll go and stand up. And in the end, of course, there was a lot of people, uh, volunteer groups, who'd who'd made sort of camps where yeah. a lot of boats arrived. But, yeah. but this wasn't an uncommon sight in the, in the early days when you would see two or three boats coming together. Yeah. yeah, but to be honest, the first time that we came back, I think that that's when really the emotion set in. And then you have time to think, you know, yeah. the fuck happened? What did we experience? Yeah. Uh, and then comes that moment where you go, we have to go back. Yeah. You know, this wasn't a one-off. We have to go back. We have to get more people on board. We have to, you know show this to the world, um, which, which we did, but in a very, yeah, very um, small way, basically. Uh, we just wanted to know, learn, mo learn more about it, know more about it, and, and go back. And um, yeah, we, we sure did. And talking about going back, um, Johnny, I understand you actually spent New Year's on Lesbos. Yeah. Um, and uh, you have to explain to me what Justin Bieber has to do with <laughs> New Year's oh, Eve, yeah. a Greek <laughs> island, and refugees. <laughs> Yeah, we came back, um, I think f first we came back in October, and the people that we were bringing to the camps, uh, those tents were really bad. Uh, they were, uh, we got involved with, with Loveland, because they were their music festival, uh, they had the tents, they had the... Um, the infrastructure. The toilets, yeah. the infrastructure, they know about the whereabouts of people, the registration, and that really helped us out. Uh, and then it became New Year's Eve. I was there for Christmas and New Year's, uh, 2015, 2016. And uh, we thought, you know, it's New Year's Eve. Uh, we have all the equipment. We have the DJ equipment. Let's welcome them with a New Year's Eve celebration. Uh, it was really cold. I think it was minus five. So we had the campfires. We had the DJ booth set up. We had the tables with food and drinks and the lights, like a little party basically. Um, we had all the cars facing the sea, the ocean, so when you saw a boat you could sign the boat because it's always critical to bring them in the right, in, in the right position. And I was, I was, we were DJing, we were having some fun basically and I was yeah, playing a Justin Bieber remix or something. When we saw a boat and we uh, managed to get the boat in safe, um, uh, we asked, uh, you know, if somebody spoke English on the boat so they could help translate and get everybody off safe one by one. Wahed, Wahed, I will never forget that. And it was a guy from Aleppo, his name was uh, Ahmed, and he said, I speak English, I'll help you. And he helped me, we got everybody off the boat safe, and we were walking towards the beach where the music was on and the lights were on, the food was there, and Ahmed said, you know, this is a very warm welcome, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, al -Arazi. Um Just one question, can you please turn off Justin Bieber? <laughs> Uh, and, and, and this is a story that when in talks, in schools or whatever, I, I always start with this story because it really gives, you know, it, it really gives these beautiful people a face uh, and a name and a sense of humor and you really break the ice with a story like this. Um, but yeah, I'll never forget it. Uh, amazing night. And everyone has an opinion about Justin Bieber, no matter <laughs> where in the world. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And so you mentioned it already. You, you've worked with organizations such as Loveland because they are familiar with the infrastructure of building a camp. Exactly, yeah. Uh, one of the other uh, things that you uh, quickly managed to arrange was to get an actual food truck to the camps. Um, again, something that I wouldn't necessarily link to a refugee camp, a food camp. It feels kind of... I don't know, strange in some way. Um, but from what I understand, the truck did a lot more than just provide food. Um, yep. It became a space for community and collaboration. Yep. Would you say, you've mentioned it a couple times before already, would you say that this was the beginning of the camp to campus model? Uh, good question. I think maybe I have to, I have to thank uh, Laura Janssen, who's also one of the, the founders of, uh, yeah. of Movement, for her uh, tricking me into buying the food truck. It's uh, something we still, uh, we still owe each other, Laura, so thank you. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I'm really glad she did. Um, uh, the, the food truck for, for us was really symbolic. You know, we were there um, uh, and you would see a thousand people just being hungry. Uh, and the only place they could buy food was from a couple of these minivans selling uh, selling sandwiches for five bucks. You know, I mean, really expensive uh, food. And we 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 felt that that was quite strange, to be honest. And and that's when the big end, uh, international NGOs started arriving, and they they were taking surveys. So you know, a week later you'd be in one of the meetings, and they would say, oh, by the way, there's a hunger for a thousand people last Saturday 
in, in the north side of the island. And, and we were there, so we would just go back to the su local supermarkets and buy all the cheese and, and, and bread we could and make sandwiches for, for people. And I think what we saw with the food truck was a more sustainable way to do that. Uh, you know, it's, it's very satisfying personally to make sandwiches and instantly give them away, but it's, it's not the most efficient way to, 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 to be providing food. And, and with essential services of, of warm clothes, dry clothes, shelter and food, you know, the, the basic, basic needs, we wanted to be able to provide on a regular basis. And, um, so I think to answer your question, you know, we didn't necessarily see it as the start of Camp to Campus, but we saw that there was fundamental breaks in, in, in the chain that we as a charity could, could, could uh, fill. Uh, and the food truck was, for me, certainly with my role as TSH, really empowering. Because I think Johnny and I, we'd had it before about, you know, sitting, watching, uh, watching for boats arriving, saying, well, why are we in TV and why am I building hotels and what the hell are we doing? I mean, this is what it's all about. And, and then with the food truck, it was a very good, um, you know, we bought the food truck and then there was, but there was no pots and pans, there was no nothing at all. And, and we as a student hotel, we were building our third hotel. Uh, so I quickly came into contact with the guy who was building our, our, our restaurant here. And I called him up on a Sunday, I said, hey, we need your help. And he, for me, what I saw was he was really keen to help. He didn't know how to help and he was really embraced the opportunity to help. So literally two days later, there was X number of pallets of cooking pans and stuff and they went out. And, and that, to me, realized that we can reach out to our network, which, which we've done really well, and that oil fleck, the oil drop that we tried to, uh, to, to, to put in there. Um, but we also, um, we saw that by, by putting a food truck and making the community part of it, by helping them, asking them to help us cook the food and prepare the food and distribute the food, they also had a purpose. So there was something for sure that sparked our, 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 our got our attention, that if we ask the people that we're helping, to be involved in giving help, then they really, they, you see that they have a, a sense of purpose, you see that they have something to do, they have responsibility, uh, they speak the language, they understand the culture better than we do, so it doesn't feel like a them and us, it feels like we're working as a team. And, and that is, I think, the essence of, of the Camp to Campus philosophy, that we're embracing the human talent, the amazing human talent that, that is here, um, it was uh, a great moment, huh? handing out those first um, warm meals. Those first warm yeah. meals, and um, I think in the in the in the in the highlight days, there's maybe three thousand people a day, three yeah. three four thousand yeah. a day. Yeah. So we made four or five thousand meals a day, and yeah. if there was three thousand, we had you know we had fifteen hundred meals left, and then we drive to uh, Afghan Hill to the other side of the yeah. island where other organizations needed food, and we just put them in these big uh, IKEA yeah, yeah, boxes. boxes and, yeah. uh, Spilt know, all over the car. And spilled all like over that. the car, yeah, it was, uh, it was such an... I've seen his, what was the name of the guy, the, the chef behind us? Because there was two chefs. The Swedish chef. The Swedish guy, the Swedish Ryan, chef. the... Ule. <laughs> <laughs> but these guys were unsung heroes, huh? because they were working yeah, inside, the inside a food container. Um, you know, the sweaty, horrible... Hendrik. Hendrik, yeah. Hendrik. Yeah. Hendrik. Yeah. Hendrik. And, Hendrik. Um, and then outside was the, the sort of glory part, giving the food out, you know? Yeah. So they, I mean, these guys really, they, they, they were impressive. Yeah, and at a certain moment it shifted to having... The, the two girls? The, 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 the two girls, but also yeah. the, the refugees themselves cooking. So yeah, yeah. just them feeling they have agency about the food that they will give to their own children, to their own yeah. family and relatives and their peers. Yeah, it, it, it brought to something to the a sense of community, you know, suddenly people were taking care of each other. Well, all, uh, instead of being witnessed as victims and needy people, you know, yeah. we were giving them responsibility and, it, and that's the start of the camp to campus yeah. philosophy, definitely. And do you feel that the sense of community and the trying to find the synergies between us and them, is that really the added value of the camp to campus model? And do you feel that that really can change the flaws that you see in the current system? Yeah, I think I think it it all started with just us b as being astonished that th there were these kind of refugee camps in Europe on European soil. That's where it started, and we just don't yeah, believe a lack, a lack of everything. A lack of everything, and 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 I, we've been talking a lot. I mean, you know, peop if there's anyone, if there are any um, uh, humans on this planet that deserve a healing environment. It's refugees. I mean, they've lost everything. Uh, families, relatives, their lives, their houses. And why are we putting them in camps where they have to survive again and fight for their food and, and, and still not uh, feel human again? So I think uh, shifting from uh, the concept of a camp to a campus, a camp us, 
where it's all about healing, where it's all about innovation, education, and, and, and inspiration. I think that's that's where we come from. You know, that's that's the starting point of, of movement on the ground. That's what we envision. Uh, if it's up to us, no one sh should be in in a camp. Um, we were surprised. I mean, it's surprising. I mean, there's a lot of refugee camps in the world. You would you would expect that there's literally a sort of a, a white book on you know do this step one, step two, step three, and, and follow it through. And you have a, a community that is at least, you know, uh, as happy as they can be there, because if, if they're content and happy and have a purpose and a community feeling, then they're, they're not going to cause trouble, they're going to be integrated into the local community. I mean, you, you'd have thought that that was there. And we were genuinely surprised that this sort of system just wasn't really there. And, and what we did and other thousands of hundreds of uh, organizations really were lifting the load uh, for, for quite some time in the early days. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, in a sense, uh, the original premise for a refugee camp was, of course, that it was supposed to be temporary, and the uh, yeah. current migration flows are unprecedented, and we've, uh, I don't think anywhere in the world have had so many refugees come in at once. Uh, so I think, in that sense, it could actually be that the original idea for a refugee camp is simply not equipped to deal with no. the amount of people no. coming in no. now. Um, but it's also, uh, I find in general, when it comes to changing things on a global scale, it can be challenging. So I think in that sense, it's very interesting to see what movement on the ground is doing from a grassroots level and using your camp to campus model to within the existing framework, trying to create something new to show that it can be done and that you really can make a change. And I, I really hope, you know, we've, we've, we've been there now five years. Uh, we started with, uh, with Oxy, our, our own improvised camp, which uh, using all of our friends' uh, equipment. Um, you know, we've been involved in Karatepi, which was one of Europe's best-run camps, um, Pikpa, of course, uh, and Moria, which was Afghan Hill, then the Olive Grove, etc. So, you know, we've, we've, we've managed thousands of people under our sort of responsibility, working with many charities, because we, we certainly can't do it alone, uh, and partners. I think we really genuinely feel that we have enough evidence to prove now that the camp-to-campus philosophy is cheaper to run, so operational costs are just dramatically cheaper. We have well, 17 members of staff in Lesbos today and 200 uh, volunteers from the community. So the manpower uh, that you have is, is incredible. We, we use that manpower where we're, we're providing skills, we're giving skills and training and, and, and everything else. We're about to launch our Movement Academy, which will, which will sort of be the, the final cap on, on, on that educational process and skill, uh, skill uh, certification process. But we genuinely feel we have enough evidence to prove that this is a cheaper model. And we can, with a shadow of a doubt, look at Karatepi and, and what we did in Moria in Afghan Hill, uh, sorry, Olive Grove, to show that the yeah, the output's the wrong word, but the, 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 there was a feeling of community. There was a, a feeling of purpose. There was less incidents. The, the police were never called to our uh, uh, place. There was no thefts or, or big dramatic incidents. It was a place of serenity in, in Mori. I mean, it was really, you, you really said, and so we, we don't understand why this is not being embraced because we know that there's massive pressure on the UN and the UNHCR to reduce costs, to find cheaper models. And we know that these guys have this type of model in their drawer, but for some reason, it's really difficult to get, get them to embrace it. And, and the core to Camp to Campus, what we're trying to do is really, in a very open way, is say, look, this model we now, we, we think we can, we can prove it. We need their help to take it to the next level, to really demonstrate and to fine tune it and to, to ribbon wrap it so that it's a proper, modern model that really works in all these uh, refugee camps. To really scale up your efforts. You know, with globalization and the environmental uh, problems, uh, and we don't seem to have managed to, to stop uh, fighting with each other and creating wars with each other, uh, I think we can safely say that the, the amount of refugees in the world is going to increase. So there has to be, I mean, there just has to be a new model. It, the old system just doesn't work. Uh, you're totally dependent on the camp director. If they're a nice uh, guy or a bad guy or a bad girl, whatever, I mean, you're completely dependent on that person. The, the, the idea that they're not in control of their own budget, they have to get everything approved through different countries. I mean, that's where really we've been very effective. We've been able to work with local contractors and, and, and provide things very, very quickly to the camp directors. Um, uh, and that, that directness is really empower, the empowerment model is really uh, something that uh, works as well. 
Well, let's hope they pick up on this soon. Let's hope so. Uh, Journey, you're what they call a famous Dutchman. And as a famous Dutchman, you have a circle of celebrities around you. And you felt that it was important to bring a couple of them to the camps. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at a video and then please explain to us what we are looking at, actually. Okay. Hi, we're seeing here two famous Afghan uh, uh, boys, uh, Shakib and Jalal. Um, yeah, they're singing Andre Haas' song Leif, uh, because on this camp, it's Karatepe, on, on Friday night there's a big tent. Every refugee would used to bring his or her phone and play their favorite song from their country. Um, so it, it was like a disco night. Um, make them feel at home a little bit, dance on their own music. Uh, but the volunteers brought their own music. So they were playing Leif. And it was always the last song. Especially the lyrics really resonated with, with the refugees. And they started singing it. Um, so they sent me this video because they know I know Andre Hazes. And um, yeah, of course, it's uh, important to activate your community and the people that you know. But we always did it in, in, in a very slow and discreet manner. We, we, didn't, um, we weren't screaming it from the rooftops. We really wanted to um, dive into it first and get as much information and get familiar with the stuff that's going on. But we did, did bring people there. Uh, and I wanted to bring Andre because uh, Andre, um, he had his thoughts about refugees, which you know he didn't know anything about. So I showed him this video, and he was like, what is this? So I explained him why they were singing it. So he made a video for Jalal, saying, Jalal, you're singing my song, that's amazing. You know, maybe one day I'll visit you. So I thought, okay, got you. <laughs> <laughs> you made a promise. <laughs> yeah, so I was in Lesbos uh, a couple of days later showing Jalal the video. So Jalal invited Andre to come to the island, and he came. And we said, Andre, do it under the radar. You know, he's usually a lot on the social media. Just go there, open, and, um, and um, you know, feel the story. So Andre came, and we showed him the different camps, and, and, and we told him our story and what's going on and why the people are fleeing. And, um, yeah, on that night, we, uh, we took him to the beach. You know, the beach is where all the boats arrive. And we had a campfire, and we had a couple of beers, and uh, obviously Jalal came. And, you know, they saw each other. And they knew each other from the videos, so they, they were like two long friends. Uh, and they hugged, and Jalal sat down with Andre, and he told him the night that he came on that very beach with his family, with his little sister, I think. Uh, um, uh, you know, and his whole travel from Afghanistan. And it, uh, yeah, it was like... They really connected. They really, they really connected, and Andre was listening, listening to him for like two hours, and he was amazed. You know, having a, a small child of his own. Um, yeah, you know, that's obviously the best way to tell someone the story on the spot where it happened with somebody who actually experienced it. And uh, yeah, like I said, they really, they really connected. And, and Jalal couldn't wait to bring Andre to the tent because it was Friday night. <laughs> to the music tent. <laughs> and for all the volunteers, but also for the refugees to have the guy singing the song that they're always ending the party with, yeah, it was just, yeah, it, it gives me, it really, it gives me goosebumps now when, I, when I'm telling it. He was there, Andre was there. Yeah, we have, I think we have the, the footage. Well, it was clearly pre-corona time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> that yeah, as yeah. well. For me, these are the these are the storytelling stories. You know, um, yeah, we mentioned Laura Jansen before. She, um, you know, she was part of the team in the beginning. She she really put her life on pause. Her career. She's a musician, and uh, um, you know, for uh, her also, to, she's going in the theaters to tell the story. I was in the theaters, and this is a very powerful story to tell people that, you know, uh, all the prejudices. Uh, that maybe people have about refugees, you know, get to know someone, listen to the story, connect, and it will it, it will change your vision. And this, for me, is a, a typical story like that that I always love to tell because it's it's true and uh, yeah, it just brings a big smile on your face. But it's, it's funny because 
you see all the drama and you see all the boats arriving and, you see, and it, it, it is, it's, it's, there's a horrible, horrible, horrible part to it. But you know, I think 90% or 95% of it is, is the most inspiring, beautiful part of humanity that you see because these people are, are coming into situations that you can't, you can't understand. But they're, you know, the kids are smiling most of the time. They're enjoying themselves. You know, it's a big adventure. You get the feeling of, and you know, the parents are doing the best. And it's, and and you're walking past. You have moments like this. You you bond with people. You connect with people. They want to, you know, you you still see the sparkle of life in 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 most of the, the eyes that you're you're walking past the tent. People are like inviting you in for tea and for lunch yeah. and for food. And and you're like, my God, how how can they possibly invite me in for? Whatever the little that they have, and it, yeah. you know, these—that's what's so contradicting about it. It's—it's it's really full of contradictions when you're there. You—you you have this dramatic scene and dramatic story, but the—the the humanity and the spark of humanity is really, really shines bright in these uh, dark, dark moments. And the resilience and the resourcefulness of people, yeah, really. even if yeah, they have definitely. nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the eagerness to, to make the best out of it. I mean, uh, you sometimes, uh, and that's why also the song of Leif was such a favorite. I mean, I mean, it, it also, it, it, it symbolizes also their story, you know, uh, live like it's your last day. And a lot of the people, unfortunately, have to, but still, you see that they make the best out of the situation. Yeah. And uh, that's very humbling, to be very honest, to yeah, see them in those conditions and still uh, uh, invite you for a cup of tea while themselves uh, living in a tent, uh, there are big learnings and lessons for us um, in that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and bringing people, not only famous Dutch people, but people from all walks of life with different backgrounds, different ages. You know, that's what we did. Uh, you know, for, for me as, as a storyteller, uh, this is what you want, to, to invite people with no expectations, just come along for a couple of days, meet the people, work in the camps, deliver the food, connect, you know, and then go home and, you know, we don't need your money or anything, but just tell us what you think and what, with your background, what, what you can contribute. Uh, and, and this is the way we've, we, we've really worked uh, the first couple of years. Still, to be honest. I Still, mean, As yeah. an organization, yeah. we're pretty bad at asking for money. <laughs> yeah. But, but we, we have amazing uh, friends and, and supporters around us. And we had a, you know, I took a lot of the corporate people, you took a lot of the media people, and, it, you know, and the deal's taken a lot of the NGOs, the journalists, the politicians and stuff. So we, and we've activated our own networks and, and really just done it on a very, you know, small group basis, one by one basis. And, yeah, really uh, personal. And really helped us get to where we are. So all of the people that have supported us have really enabled all of the things uh, that yeah. we've done to happen. So you've uh, shown yourself to be very willing and to be very eager. Um, I was told that uh, you've actually compared yourself and the start of Movement Underground with the A-Team. Um, now, for the younger viewers out there who don't know what the A-Team is, it is an uh, 80s show about four <laughs> former US soldiers who were dishonorably discharged and are now for hire to fight bad guys and injustice. Um, and the guys are very resourceful because they always built something out of nothing, it seems. Mm -hmm. Um, I am a big fan of the A-Team, so I am personally very curious as to why you would compare yourself to the A-Team. Is it because you have that 80s vibe, or is it because you're secretly all former soldiers? What's, what's with the A-Team? Johnny what's looks like BA, to be very <laughs> honest. Yeah. But it's, it's pretty scary, though, that somebody that you have to explain what is the A-Team. I mean, it makes me feel pretty, pretty well, normal. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it first aired yeah. in 83, and yeah. I think uh, a lot of the, uh, um, the supporters of Movement yeah. Underground might be uh, slightly younger, yep. so it, yeah. uh, it doesn't hurt to explain. Yeah. I think we always, we're always optimists in any situation. You know, we always see either an escape or a way <laughs> to get to the goal, and I think that's also... Or a solution. Or a, yeah, solution. or a solution, you know. Um, being the underdogs, being a very small grassroots, um, we still find... Driving in a van. <laughs> <laughs> None of it like cigars, though. Driving uh, in yeah. a van. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know... Uh, Always seeing the solution, seeing the creative, the creative uh, part of things, uh, and being optimistic. You know, and, and, and uh, that's also that I think. That's, and again, that's coming from these people that arrive, that are that have the resilience, that have the the, the optimism, then why shouldn't we? You know, we're yeah. we're there to, to help. So if these people have it, then you yeah. know, as sure as hell, we should have it. Well, it was nice. I mean, we got uh, called by uh, the head of mission from the UNHCR some time ago, a, a startup NGO. Uh, and what I like about that definition was um, was really the ability to think as a startup, you know. And when you're a startup in any any uh, field, you have a goal, 
you don't know how you're going to get there and sometimes, most often, you don't have the resources to, to get your end results. So you have to be innovative, you have to be entrepreneurial, um, and you have to, to, to kind of make it up as you go along. And, and we've, we've learned a huge amount in the last five years. Uh, and time goes really quickly there. I mean, you, you, you know, five years is, is a pretty long time to be involved in the, in the European refugee crisis. Um, Especially when it was never the ID. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> we never went to Lesbos to start an organization and be in the field no. five years along no. the road. So, no. it's, uh, so we learn a lot. Yeah. But I think you know, that's where the analogy uh, comes in and, and yeah. probably stops. <laughs> stops okay. <laughs> stops okay. Now yeah. it almost feels a bit inappropriate when you yeah, say yeah. it. Yeah. But still, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it, sh it should be looked you know, funny. It's taking with, the positive with a, with side a wink. of the Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And who, would, who wants to be Hannibal? Who's, who's the plan maker? Yeah, good one, yeah. Not me, that's for sure. <laughs> I think Laura Janssen yeah. was the Laura, 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 okay. Laura, Laura, Laura. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> good old Laura. She's good not here, yeah. <laughs> so, um, guys, before we uh, look ahead to the future, let's uh, see if, if, if you look at all these stories, if you look at five years of movement underground, um, how would you summarize the adventure thus far? You can, you can give me one word or one short sentence. The last five years, yeah. one sentence, my God. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, it's been completely life-changing. Um, you know, I, I uh, yeah, I, I one sentence. Yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been life-changing. Life-changing. Yeah. Adil. Uh, whew, difficult uh, one sentence, but I think uh, a humbling roller coaster. A humbling roller coaster. I like that one. Yeah. Johnny. Yeah, same. Life-changing roller coaster. Humble, um, but also um, very colorful and uh, friendships from all over the world for the rest of my life. That's a good one. Friendships. Yeah. yeah. Humbling, friendships, life changing. Okay. Yeah. So let's uh, take a moment to look at the future. Um, in five years, we'll come back here again. It'll then be the 10 year commemoration of movement on the ground. I get to interview you again. Very exciting, of course. <laughs> Where will you be? Where will the organization be? And uh, you personally, what, what do you think that you'll be doing by then? Honey? Yeah, good question. I mean, I, I have I, to think about this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Five years time. I mean, you know, I, I genuinely hope that movement on the ground does not need to exist. That, that the, the philosophy that we, we think works has been adapted by the real professionals and is taken over and I and I genuinely hope that we as Europe are, are embracing the refugee crisis. I don't think it's going to go away and we have to accept that and we have to find a way to deal with it. I, I hope that there is a general understanding that refugees can happen, we, everyone can be a refugee, especially here in Holland with the environmental crisis, it's something we should be aware of and, and that there is a not a need for 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 grassroots organizations like ourselves. And you know, if we still are here and we're still needed, then, then fantastic movement's gonna, gonna do its thing. Uh, personally, I think there's, there's, we've got a great team and I hope that there's somebody, uh, somebody else sitting here uh, you know, taking us forward for the, the, next, uh, the next period. Sounds good, a deal. Wow. Have you uh, had enough time to think about this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big question because um, if you were, if you would have told, if you asked this question five years ago, I would never have imagined that we would be here where we are now, five years along the road, with an amazing group of people, um, uh, ambassadors around the world, uh, uh, having touched the lives of so many people, uh, and being very grateful uh, about it. So, it's it's difficult to say where in five years' time. I really hope, just like Charlie says, but maybe it's utopian that we won't be needed, you know. Uh, we started because we saw a, a flawed system. Um, uh, as Movement Underground, we always have said we would like to change that system uh, from the inside out. Uh, that's really something that I think we're all working uh, towards. Uh, I hope in five years' time from now that the humanitarian industry would also embrace the camp to campus philosophy and that we would all work together uh, in changing camps into communities, if they're still there. 
making it healing environments, thriving environments where people can be human beings again, not having to survive again. Um, and um, uh, we're already an, an amazing group of people, but I, I hope that we're going to be like an oil stain globally, uh, having more and more people on board um, that will uh, carry that torch. Um, and, and like uh, Charlie said, and, and hopefully uh, other people will be uh, having those uh, questions that you've asked us today uh, in their paths and in, in their journeys. That's really... Uh, uh, what I uh, envision in five years' time. Creating a global movement. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And Johnny, how about you? Yeah, I agree. I mean, hopefully, you know, we're not um, we're not needed anymore in in five years. But uh, that that's going to be a long shot. For for me personally, um, I, I think it's a um, uh, time to leave the movement. Uh, on a personal level, uh, I will be doing more uh, shows like this: podcasts, webinars, uh, uh, interviews, talk shows where I, I feel I have to be a little bit more Switzerland, so that also um, accounts uh, the other ambassadors uh, that I'm doing for the Vergeten Kind, for the Vrienden Loterij. Um, yeah, I want to start operating under my own flag more, but uh, like I said before, I'm the storyteller of this story, which I always will be doing, but as a board member and as, as an advisor, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's time to uh, let some, someone else step in. Um, but it's, it's been quite an adventure, uh, and I, I still want to go back. We still have some projects we have to finish with the Cryf Foundation, for example, to put two Cryf courts on the island, um, one for the refugees, one for the locals. So, um, you know, these are my, my buddies forever, and, uh, and so are the refugees. So, um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's time. We've been talking about it for the whole year. The timing has been off every time. Um, but, but I think this, 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 this is a good moment to, um, to speak about it. Well, I think there's never the right time to leave something, but no. um, taking a step down uh, from the public eye for movement, but still, of course, I can imagine um, uh, in your heart for always. For sure, absolutely, yeah. And there's, and there's always going to be five founders of, of Movement on the Ground. You can't take that away from, from anyone. And, you know, we're Dylan and, uh, and Laura are not here today, but, you know, they, are, they, uh, they earned their, their patches. And, and Laura, yeah. you know, is... Uh, is a part of the the heart of uh, of, of movement, uh, you know. So, so I think it's a natural evolution, and I, I do think it's uh, it's great. We've got an amazing team, amazing team in Holland, uh, amazing team. We saw some of them in in uh, in on the ground, uh, and part of our whole philosophy is really you know creating space and um, and, and empowering people and giving them a platform as well. And uh, you know, if, uh, if they don't know who A Team is, then it's definitely time for us <laughs> to move over. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've definitely laid the foundation for movement on the ground to grow in the next couple of years. Um, I'd like to thank you uh, for your time today. Uh, it was great to hear more about what you have been doing and what you're still doing. And we, of course, wish you all the best with the developments in the camps, both on Lesbos and on Samos. And we will continue to follow your work, of course. Now, we want to hear from you as well. Uh, you might think, how can I support Movement on the Ground's mission? Um, it can actually be anything from a suggestion uh, for the camp to campus model, or it can be an inspiring message to someone in the camp. Maybe you have suggestions for partners that you think we should work with. Uh, or of course, you can always make a donation. You can submit your questions, statements, or videos to fundraiser at movementontheground.com. Uh, and if you'd like to make a contribution to movement, head over to movementontheground.com slash donation or start your own fundraiser at movementontheground.kenta.com. And don't forget to check out Movement's social channels because uh, we'll be hosting a lot more live talks with Movement on the Ground members and partners in the lead up to five years of Movement on the Ground. That's it for now. Have a great day and see you again soon. Bye.